Hello and welcome to this video guide to the Henry's Avalanche Talk Safety is Freedom Pocket Guide. This short video shows you step by step how to apply the framework of key safety points that can help you to be safer and to have more fun off piste and ski touring. You don't have to have this pocket guide to get a lot out of this video, but it does help. And you can get it on the Henry's Avalanche Talk.com website. These key safety points in the HAT framework are the points that were not applied by victims of avalanches. Usually after analysis of the accident, it's determined that three or four of these points were not applied. Furthermore, most accidents can be avo avoided. We know this since A. Most victims trigger the avalanche themselves. And B. There were clear signs of danger that were ignored. So the aim of this framework method is to help you and your group apply the points that make things safer and to help you not to be blind to the obvious signs of danger. The definition of acceptably safe here at the bottom is number five, the approximate danger level of daily actions like driving a car for an hour or so. You can keep things within this context of acceptably safe in avalanche terrain if you follow and apply the points in this framework. So let's get started. Step one, where you go, decision making. Are we going steeper? Are we going into avalanche terrain? That is the big question here. During this decision making step, go for the low hanging fruit in risk free areas of less than 30 degree slope steepness. If you're skiing in an area where there's no slopes of 30 degrees above you um, that you're on or below you, you can have an enormous amount of fun in a no risk area, risk avoidance area. Areas where there are steep slopes of 30 degrees steepness or more is avalanche terrain. 30 degrees is steep. To give you an idea, steep parts of black runs in Europe are around 30 to 35 degrees maximum. Given the tiny number of accidents involving wet and hu humid snow, simply avoiding these steep slopes when there's a rapid rise in temperature, especially when there is new snow, seems to work as a rule. But almost all avalanche accidents involve cold, dry slab avalanches that were triggered by the victims themselves, and the slab released on a slope of 30 degrees or steeper. You need to watch out above, too, not only because more and more idiots seem to be triggering avalanches on top of other people, but also because in certain conditions you can trigger an avalanche remotely, à distance as they say in French, especially when the danger level is high. So if you are on or below or around slopes that have a 30 degree steepness or more, you are in avalanche terrain. There are several ways you can develop a sense of what 30 degree slope steepness feels like, looks like, and how you can see slope steepness on a map. It's a really good idea to develop your sense of what a 30 degree slope angle is in order to be able to decide on where you go and, and if you're going steeper into avalanche terrain. Here, choose an initial score of five or six, depending on the steepness of the slopes you're thinking of going on to. Next, add the score of the danger level for the day, then review the definitions for the danger levels that are summarized in the pocket guide on this page here. If you look at the danger level on the card, you will see the scores jump in numbers at levels three and four. This is because avalanche danger does not increase in a gradual, linear sort of way. Avalanche danger increases at an accelerated exponential rate, as the Swiss and European avalanche warning services show here on this graph. Also, it is important to look at the danger scale as having four levels, as this graph suggests. Level 5 is a rare exception. Think of it as only concerning da disaster management pros. Plus, if you think of the scale in terms of four levels, three all of a sudden looks like a more elevated place, which is more accurate with reality. Finally, you must read the avalanche forecast bulletin, even if all you get out of it is the danger level and recent avalanche activity over the last 24 to 48 hours. Recent accidental avalanche activity is especially revealing. Taking note of the recent avalanche activity, especially recent accidental avalanche activity 
of cold, dry slab avalanche activity from the last 24 to 48 hours on the actual day will help you to fit the danger level into what is really happening. Add a score of zero if there has been no recent activity or scores of plus two or plus four, depending on what you see and what you have heard about. What you have heard about from credible sources. Credible sources are not the drunk guy who you met at the end of the bar last night who thinks he knows everything. At this point, you'll have a high initial score on the scale below. Step two, how you go risk reduction. Remember, you don't have to be perfect at applying these points. The most important thing is that you are trying, doing the best you can. Are there any terrain traps under the steep slopes you are heading to, like holes, trenches, cliffs, trees, or even things like ponds or lakes under the slope? Terrain traps can make even little avalanches deadly. Are you and your group willing and able to avoid prolonged exposure to terrain traps? If yes, reduce your initial score from the first column by two points. Keeping distances between each person will reduce the risk of triggering an avalanche and the risk of having more than one person buried if the worst happens. A good reference for how far you should be from each other is about the width of the crown fractures of recent avalanche activity in the last 24, 48 hours or so. If there is no sign of recent slab avalanche activity, then keep 10 to 15 meters apart and try to expose just one person at a time to steep slopes above and any dangers below. If in doubt, go one at a time on the slope. Are you and your group willing and able to keep appropriate distances between people in the groups as you go up, down, or across slopes? And until you get to safe or safer zones, where it is reasonable to regroup? If yes, reduce the total by one point. Safe and safer zones refer to A, totally safe zones, places that are totally unexposed and completely out of any avalanche path. See the icons with a white check in a green circle for these totally unexposed safe places. Safer zones are places that are not totally exposed to steep slopes above, they are more or less protected, but may be not totally sheltered from a larger than anticipated avalanche releasing from above. See the icons with a red exclamation point in a green circle. These are places that are preferable to being totally exposed in the middle of a slope, but they are very temporary gathering points, not places to hang out for hours having a picnic. Exposed zones that can, can and should not be gathering places are shown with a red exclamation point on its own or in the triangle. Do you have a plan for gathering at a safe or safer zone? And an escape route to get to it? If you trigger a slab? If yes, reduce your total scores by one point. Now, you have a total for the scores in the two columns, and you can start to situate yourself on the scale below. But before coming to a conclusion in step four, we need to look at Step three, what you do in a crisis. Someone is buried in an avalanche. Since the best chances of survival are in the first 15 minutes of burial, you all need to be able to perform a self-contained partner rescue and count on an organized mountain rescue team only for essential medical support. Do all of you have an avalanche transceiver, shovel and probe? If not, don't go. Have you done a simple practice search for a transmitting transceiver? And does everyone know at least how to put their probe and shovel together? Have you gone over an avalanche transceiver rescue summary like the Henry's Avalanche Talk Rescue Guide that you see here? If those answers are yes, and if you've done a partner check, checking everyone's transceiver's search and send functions work, then finally you need to work together to remind each other to apply all these points. It's easy to get complacent because most of the time nothing happens, even if you're not applying them. Human factors experts say that we all make an average of 30 errors a day, so we need to be willing to act as co-pilots, checking each other from time to time and making sure that everybody in the group is at least trying to apply these nine key safety points in avalanche terrain, even if it seems like no avalanches will be triggered. 
So as a team, in step four, take the score you added in the first decision-making column and then take the scores you added up in the risk reduction part in step two and subtract that, subtract that from the total. Now place yourselves on the scale to get a sense of where you are. Then there's two more quick fine-tuning things to look at. Skier compaction. If you're in places that, that have been very heavily skied by hundreds of people in recent weeks, you can subtract points. And persistent weak layers, if the avalanche bulletin and or credible sources have been talking about persistent weak layers in the snowpack, you need to add points. Now, once you have a total score and have situated yourself on the scale, it's up to you and your group to decide what is acceptably safe for you, including maybe not going into avalanche terrain at all. 5 out of 10 is about the level of risk we take when we confront the dangers of everyday life, like driving a car for an hour or so. When you get up to 7, it's roughly like riding a motorcycle. The main thing is that you and your group go through the points in the framework continually and applying them, and with the scoring method, like right here, or with the quick view of the framework's key points, like right here. You don't need to be perfect, just do it, and do it as a group. Holy cow. For more details on these key safety points, see the Essentials Talk, In-Depth Talks, and more on both the Henry's Avalanche Talk YouTube channel and henrysavalanchetalk.com, where safety is freedom.